graduated in uh, economics uh, at Bologna University. And after that, he got uh, an MBA degree at the uh, Harvard uh, Business School. Uh, Mr. Fortelli, professional experience started from consulting Eastern industry. And after that, uh, many uh, top positions in uh, state-owned company, uh, remember, uh, in Mechanica and Deere Group, and also uh, worldwide very well-known uh, institutions such as uh, World Bank and the European Investment Bank. From 2001, Mr. Fortelli is also the founder and managing director of Mandarin Capital Management and uh, also founder and chairman of Observatorio Asia. Observatorio Asia is a non-profit entity with uh, the research focus on uh, Asia. So we are very glad to have uh, so special guest tonight with us. And uh, uh, just let me remember that uh, in September last year, Kaixin uh, Media Group uh, mentioned Mr. Fortelli blog in China as one of the top 10 uh, blog in China of economics and business uh, due to the number of uh, Chinese uh, readers. So for sure it's a very special event and uh, the, the event uh, is scheduled with a, a talk with Mr. Fortelli for uh, around 30 minutes. After that we will have uh, a Q&A session. Please uh, take this opportunity to make whatever kind of questions Mr. Fortelli because I think that it's a very special opportunity for us. Uh, uh, to, to know a bit more about Mr. Fortelli's vision about China. Uh, it's very difficult for me to start uh, with some questions. Uh, I, I mentioned Mr. Fortelli that uh, I would like for sure to know a bit more about uh, his personal experience uh, measured in China when uh, his experience uh, started. And uh, the main question that is the question, very banal one, but uh, I think uh, very important. Uh, we would like to understand, Mr. Fortelli, where is China going? So, your opinion about the future of this country and uh, if uh, we really should be worried about China's current economic situation. So I uh, thank you very much again. Uh, <coughs> thank, you. thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, inviting me. I, I love to be with you. Nothing more interesting for me at the moment. I also recently moved from uh, Shanghai to Beijing. So this is probably why you haven't seen much of me here. Uh, but uh, after several years, I decided to move here again. And then uh, we met at Emilio uh, Spadavecchia's departure party. And here I am. Um, I think uh, my story. I started in Asia in 1994. Um, that uh, it wasn't uh, random; it was well thought of. Um, from uh, in the early 90s, I was head of privatization at uh, IRI. It was a major state-owned holding company in Italy. It was about 25% of GDP, so it was very big. I mean, most of you are too young to remember, but we owned everything. We owned the highways, we owned all the banks, we owned uh, Darmine, we owned uh, Autogrill, we owned Alitalia, we owned yeah, just like anything, yeah, anything you can think of. We owned Fiat Meccanica, we owned Fiat Cantieri, and then in the early in the early 90s, most of you probably don't remember, in Italy there was a process called clean hands. So where like uh, the judges put like uh, a lot of people in jail and, and well, deserved jail. I mean, uh, so we sort of felt, you know, it was like very fizzy years for me. I mean, I was, I thought that, that uh, Italy was going to change for real and I was very excited and um, at that time, in the early 90s, I was Chief of Staff to the Minister of Treasury. Then I was Chief of Staff to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And in the end, I landed and I became Head of Privatization and IRI. That was difficult years. It was the famous uh, uh, Andreata uh, Van Mier Treaty that forced Italy to divest of all the state-owned company to, to ensure a level playing field. And, uh, all the privatization process. So, um, I need to. It's okay. Am I starting too far? Okay. I just um, 
So privatization was hard. As it is hard here, it was hard there. I mean, uh, Italy is a good school for China. Eh? I mean, yeah, you know, if you just uh, and uh, after all this and after all these big hopes, and then uh, in 1994. Mr. Bungasconi got elected, and uh, that didn't go right, quite right with me. You know, I was hoping for something different, and he wasn't my man. Also because at that time my chairman was Professor Prodi, so uh, so I felt I want to, you know, just the disillusionment. For uh, you were too young, but for someone who really was hoping that country, Italy, would be a different country, and then. The Champi came up and Craxi left and then Amato. I mean, decent people, okay? We did decent, good things. And I said, I want to get the hell out of here. And this time, where do I go? You know? Because before, all through the 80s, I, was, I lived in the States and so on, so it was natural to look west. But this time, I to, you know, just, we've got to go east. You know, it was obvious already in the early 90s, if you were exposed to U.S. management, uh, U.S. literature, or U.S. economy, it was obvious the world was going east. Okay? Um, so I just uh, figured and, uh, that I need to come to Asia, and uh, I became chairman for Fimechanica for all of Asia. The Mechanica is, 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 was an IRI owned company and is Italy's second largest Italian industrial company. Uh, we make, it's like a, the small version, the Italian version of a GE or a Siemens, Italian version. Um, still a $50 billion company. So I moved to Singapore oh, in the 90s, the world was different. All the action was in Southeast Asia. You really didn't want to be in China in the 90s, okay? Because it was still, I mean, it was like, you know, the action was Bangkok, KL, Singapore, Jakarta exploding, you know, it really, yeah, yes, that was, that was the fun part. And, uh, but I had all of uh, Asia under me, and so I got to know a lot, and I started, I came to China already, I started coming to China in 94, and, uh, we did quite good business in the in several fields, so I get used to Asia and China very soon, and I kept doing that for four years. And then the Asia crisis came. Am I being too detailed? The mm -hmm. Asia crisis in 1998 was a big shock, especially wiped out Southeast Asia. Uh, China cruised right through it, okay, but Southeast Asia got smashed, and. Uh, and, um, and that happened that um, I was called in by the World Bank and uh, I moved to DC and uh, to look after the restructuring of the, of the Asia crisis. So in 98 I moved to Washington DC to look at the Asia crisis. So I kept coming to Asia but I was in uh, Washington DC. Washington. And, um, I did that for a couple of years, and um, then in um, 2000 something, in '99, the Kosovo, the war in Kosovo started. Do you remember that? Then, when it ended, I was asked <laughs> to come up. When it ended, I was asked to come over to take over the Balkan reconstruction effort. So I, I was seconded by the World Bank to the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg. Because uh, they made a sort of agreement, the Bears, the Bank of Reconstruction and Development in London would take care of private sector development. The World Bank would take care of uh, institutional development. In the EIB, there was like a harder and more solid bank with a much bigger balance sheet would take over infrastructure reconstruction. So my life took a sudden turn from a uh, five-star suite in, uh, in Makati or at uh, Oriental in Bangkok, I find myself spending the night in Banyaluka or Srebrenica or something. That was, that was quite a shock. I mean, like, it was misery and, uh, and uh, cemeteries all over the place and uh, it was really sad. I remember like spending a whole, like 
the only thing people could do there was like uh, get out in the street to stroll around 7 p.m. something like that. And even in the smallest town, the, st the streets were like full. There was not nothing else to do. And I remember like strolling for an hour back and forth, seeing thousands of people, not a single one crossing my eyes. I could not make eye contact with a single person because they were mad. They were either Serbs, so they were mad because they didn't get, they said, why did you bomb us? I was a Western, right? So I said, I'm sorry, why did you bomb us? Or they were Muslim in Bosnia and I said, who the heck are you? You're not Muslim. So for one reason or another, I didn't fit any place. Anyway, I did this for, I did that and we got that going. It was mainly like, mainly was a electricity distribution and bridge to rebuild. The first big emergency. Then, um, that was 2001. I was uh, 45. And I said, I, I better go back now and have something regular. And then I tried to inject myself in the labor market again in Italy. And they said, who? You? And they said, Fuchelli, you've done all the heck you want all your life. You're not totally unemployable, they told me. <laughs> so, you just think there's no way anybody would ever give you a job. You've done the heck. The any shit you want in all your life. I mean, you know, you're unemployable. Well, I was sort of like too young to, to give it up. And um, I was left with one, one big hobby in, in Luxembourg. I grew a big hobby that was bicycling. Because the only thing you can reasonably do in Luxembourg is bicycling <laughs> when it's not raining. Okay? So I had become some sort of like a, a a, a, a forest gump of bicycling, bicycling all the time, you know, bicycling, 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 you know, like day, night, Saturday, Sunday. Huh? And so I go back, it's an opportunity flashed to my life, Italy's biggest bike company is on sale, which is Atala. So I buy, so I do a leverage buyout of Atala. And it is obvious, as I'm talking about 2001, 2002, it was 200,000 bikes. It was obvious that the problem was like you couldn't stand up to the competition, you know, coming from, uh, from Asia, Taiwan, China, Vietnam, so on. So I basically stripped out the manufacturing and the component and I, I put it into a, I stripped into a separate company and I took the company over to Shanghai. And we started sourcing and manufacturing in China. Used to source components out to China, manufacture the bikes in Turkey. Because there is a no anti dumping uh, between uh, China and EU, that a mounted bicycle has a 45%. So you basically can buy China components, but you have to mount, mount the bikes, bike in a low cost country nearby. So either Croatia or Turkey. And then, but then I created the sourcing company that was sourcing components. And then uh, we restructured the Atala because the cost came down quite a bit. And, uh, and then what I did was like, uh, apart from I kept going, bicycling a lot. I kept going, I bicycling, bike. every week I would change a bike, I would try different colors and so on. I was really an artist. I, was, I wasn't really taking care like, of management was either new bikes, like the technical office, or in the office, or the supply, supply chain. And then, this company, basically what I did was, I developed into a sourcing company for, uh, com for components for medium-sized European company. Metal, electronics, plastic components, and so on. Custom-made components, not Christmas ornaments, no toys, no textiles, okay? We would make you know, a piece of, piece of steel, a piece of wood, a PC board or something like that. And the company just like boomed. It was, it was called Sourcing Solution, it was boomed. So I would go to any like Italian or German company and say, well, this, where do you put it here? 
How much do you pay for this? Five euro? Okay, I'll deliver it for two. Deal done. You know, the, co the cost advantage China had was humongous then. So the company developed, and then one day, am I too long here for the theory? Are you sure? You're gonna tell me? Okay. And then, and then one day, just just by mistake, I was invited to a sh TV show. At <laughs> that time, it was called L'Infedele. It means the unloyal, by the famous anchorman. And it was a program about China, because in the middle 2000, Italy discovered China. Like 2003, 2004, it was a big debate. Before, China didn't exist. Then, uh, and then, uh, so there was a whole discussion about China, and people were saying a lot of what seemed crap to me, and I came up with this sentence. It takes a Chinese to beat the Chinese. <laughs> like Briscoe, you know that card? That you, you know, Briscoe is, uh, is uh, flowers, you need to have flowers, otherwise you can not count nothing. I came up, it takes, that attracted the, the, the attention of the audience, and since that minute, for the large public, I became a China star. <laughs> and then I, that thing picked up, and you know, I kept, you know, everything that would happen in Asia that would call on me. Until uh, one day in 2004 or something, I said, well, why does everybody call, call me? And that was quick. I mean, uh, Romeo is now a good old China hand. So we, we met in Singapore, Romeo and I were in Singapore in the, in the early 90s, at the beginning, and we are here today, next door. So, yeah, basically, I, the problem was, there was nobody else the journalists could call on. Because the whole Italian school system, university system, there was like a single professor that was training kids on what was going to be the major change in human civilization of the last few centuries, the rise of China. They were just coming out of school knowing nothing about what was really coming out in the world. There was no professor trained and skilled that had any capability. There was no China study center. You know, in the US you have, you have the Fairbank Center at Harvard, you have the Brookings Institution, you have a lot of China centers. Okay? Nothing. You know, in Italy there was nobody. And then I talked to Romeo and we said, no, I think we should do something about it. And we set up this uh, research center called Osservatorio Asia, whose purpose was simply to, to get private fund and channel it through university, uh, young university assistant professor or researcher who want to become professors and teach about China or Asia business. That's, you know, because if you want to start educating the kids, you have to create the teachers. So, and so we said the focus is on university. We're going to fund only people who are going to just make out of Asia a career. And uh, funds are only going to be private because if you touch public fund, sooner or later you're going to go to jail in Italy for one reason or another. So it's just like, they keep bad luck. That's for sure. So, and then, oh, and then Osservatorio has a picked up that was, was was a success. I mean, it developed very well, and then you just, you know, there was like, whatever happened, there was a tsunami in, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, you know, just like, it was like, uh, the World Bank says, Goldman Sachs says, Observatorio Asia says. That was, <laughs> we were sort of like, uh, we were. and uh, so, and uh, Observatorio Asia is still thriving. And um, then we get down to 2005, and I was dealing with my sourcing company with the Chinese entrepreneur and so on. And then I thought, you know what? Why should I? Why should I just buy components? Why don't I buy the whole company? <laughs> and I, why do I waste the time just to come here and buy some PC board? Why don't I buy the whole thing? And also, I figured. Yeah, those Chinese entrepreneurs were just wanted to, there was a lot of ambition there. And um, I figured way back that Chinese capital was going to be going outbound, was going to be, I figured it was going to be a big, a big thing. 
and uh, I, I figured that if Italy would move early on, we could be like a nice launching pad to accommodate Chinese investment. Okay, so I just I I went to my my door. Okay, anybody falling asleep? <laughs> so I went to. Uh, then I figured, well, I need some banks to give me some money. And, uh, and also I need a team, I need a, an investment team because I'm not an investment guy, I'm a management guy. So I found a management team on the market that had good experience, that to set up another fund was about to, in, in, I convinced them about this, about this China thing. And, uh, and then I went to talk to, I had the line, and it was Mr. Modiana San Paolo, Mr. Passer Bank Intesa, Mr. Profumo Uni Credit. But there was uh, three banks. I went to the one whom I liked the most, it was Mr. Pietro Modiano. I go in and I say, Pietro, you know, I want to do this. And he said, how much do you need? And I said, 60 million euro. Okay, in four minutes. We are in business. Then uh, I waited three months for the board resolution. Is the end day easy to get 60 million? You know, I mean, it's just a, you, the first meeting was six, four minutes, but then it took us about three months to get the papers for the board. And then I came over, came over to China with the Sao Paulo board approval. Sao Paulo later was merged with Bank Intesa, became Bank Intesa Sao Paulo. At that time, it was this Sao Paulo. I came over. I went to the Chinese government and said, I very soon, an entrepreneur, I want, want to go outbound and, and uh, like uh, they're going to be, they're going to need support to go after small and medium sized companies. Italy is the country of small and medium sized companies. You should really make a fund to drive their outbound process. And I really met some fantastic people uh, here in Beijing and I said, what a good idea. So by the end of the day, in 2006, the Chinese government instructed CDB and Exit to give, to give us 150 million euro. In the meantime, Sao Paulo had approved 75, then made 225. We raised another 100 through institution. We closed at 328. And then we had the first ever outbound fund, cross-border fund, and it was the first time ever the China institution mainly, uh, invested in a private foreign private equity fund. There was no private equity renminbi market, there was no private equity law. That's how we got started. And uh, ever since that, you know, we, we did fine. We went through two crises, we gave a good return, and uh, Chinese still cannot believe they got screwed by Americans, they got screwed by it. And then they couldn't believe that they made money with Italians in Italy. <laughs> so that was uh, something. Uh, and uh, so now we are getting to our second fund. Um, uh, and the, but the second fund, we have bigger ambition. We're going to target the core of Europe. We're going to target Germany. We're going to target uh, uh, Austria, Switzerland, the whole big industrial corridor that goes from Hamburg down to Florence. My partner, Marcus, from Frankfurt is here. Thank you, Marcos, for putting up with us. And, um, and so now we are into this great uh, adventure of uh, establishing uh, uh, the first truly European-wide uh, investment platform for Chinese uh, companies or for invest Chinese investment money. You either buy Chinese company or Italian or Swiss, it doesn't make any difference, whatever. Um, either we buy Chinese, we help them develop in Europe, as we did with Zoom, uh, with Zoom Line and Chifa. That was the biggest, uh, the largest Europe, Chinese investment in Europe at the time, it was more than 500 million euro. Or we buy into a European company, help them develop uh, in China. Uh, we bought into Dagong, the China rating agency. We're now getting the license to operate uh, in Europe. That's also a very, very difficult uh, process to getting through under the big three rating system and being able to operate in Europe ain't, ain't that easy. Um, uh, we, we, I mean, the secret, I don't know, we made every possible mistake. We made them all. If I read 
on what premises we got the money in 2006 and how we spent it. And just, there's no match. Well, you are lucky. None of the mistake was lethal. So we just like made it, but not, none of them killed us. So we came up with a good return. We made 10 investments. We make money on all 10 of them. And uh, it's a fairly consistent return. There is not a jackpot, but there's not a disaster. We show continuity. We're very well received in Germany, and uh, we're very well supported by uh, the Chinese financial system, and here we are. In the meantime, you know, I, I, I moved up. I, was, I started always, always, always at the place in Hong Kong, then I moved to Shanghai. Now the Shanghai team is really up and running, and then we opened the Beijing office. We have, we have the big bar from Beijing. Yanni, are you there? Miss Yanni Kong, and then, um, then uh, you know, I get to be old. I could really, st st the guys in Shanghai that need me. In the beginning, they needed me because I had to explain what man that it was. Now, you know, I'm, I'm the bag of potatoes. The less I go, the better it is because I slow them down. So they were happy to ship me to Beijing, and uh, I'm well taken care in Beijing. and. Uh, I have like the office and the home next door to each other, so they take care of me. And, um, and now we're going for fun too. Um, and um, you know, I, my, um, I mean, I just wouldn't do anything else. Why I like doing this? Because uh, I mean. The question is not because I make money because this, because, it, I mean, uh, there is nothing, nothing that, that brings people together as when you make investment. I mean, if you really want to integrate cultures, you want to integrate people, you've got to make investments. I mean, when people make investment, because, you know, Chinese have this idea that everything is government to government. When you go to Europe, you have to deal with, with, with small and medium size. They don't give a shit about government. They couldn't care less about what the government say. You know, they do just the opposite. You really have to integrate yourself with the civil society, which is a different game. You need to be part of the civil society. You need to be, enjoy the conversation, understand what their concerns are, make yourself enjoyable, and, and uh, you know, you just have to really understand the, the inner self of the people you're, you're dealing with and you have to become very trustworthy and that's what uh, was happening I mean uh, my team, my Chinese team is, is getting more and more to get uh, into the civil society in Europe and uh, they're getting very much uh, to be liked and there is a great process of, of uh, understanding each other and uh, I think being part of this, of this, uh, of this uh, whole evolution uh, makes, makes my life uh, interesting. Uh, Chinese album is something that's gonna, is gonna change the world. It's a big wave. Either you get it right in your face or you surf on it. So I try to surf as much as I can, okay? Because you know, as I surf, I have fun, no matter whether, how much money I make. Also, I'm, I'm a workaholic, so I don't have very expensive hobbies anyway. So, <laughs> so, so now I'm into special cars, or like uh, arts, or like boats, or anything. So this is... Eh? See, no, but I'll go, coming to China, I had to give up on bicycles. Because uh, now that was, uh, that was uh, because here, obviously, it's complicated, you know, because it doesn't yield itself. Because I live in a little town out of Bologna, out in the country, I don't know, here, how do I get out of Beijing? And also, and when I'm in Europe, in the morning, it's just the time which is the hottest, because I have all the phone calls with China. So I can't really in the morning go out and go bicycling, because it's my worst time. I really need to be there at the computer. In the old time, I could go biking with earphone and speaking on the phone. But nowadays, you've got to be on, on the computer, on your iPad. And that doesn't quite work well, biking with the iPad. I try. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't go well.
So yeah, Viking had to give it up. And I gave some weight, but yeah, you know, but um, that's uh, the end of part one. Now, you want to ask me some question, or you want me to keep going? Ah, easy anyway. Up to you, I guess. How do you prefer? Hey, we can go ahead maybe with the with the, the main topics, and after that, yeah. maybe open the Q and A section. Yeah. Let me see what. I was given as a, as a, as just to bypass the U.S. economy by 2020 and to become the largest economy in the world, um, economy in the world. Um, I have no doubt about that. Uh, why I have no doubt? Because. Uh, Chinese people are very hardworking um, because uh, young people are phenomenal. Young Chinese are like incredible asset, and so the new generation, you know, five years younger, they're better and better. And uh, so you generally have the opposite in other countries, but here in China, the younger they are, the better they are. Uh, they study hard, they work hard. Is a gigantic market. Um, you know, scale makes a difference. You know, when you can talk about you know, 1.4 uh, billion people, makes a difference. A number of things. You know, I used to like going to Southeast Asia. Now, I mean, if anybody invites me to go to Vietnam, I waste my time. Uh, only 80 million people. What are they doing here? I mean, it's boring. You know, just, you know, and they say, oh, you should look at Bo Myanmar, oh, come on. I mean, it's like, you know, worth my time, okay? That's what happened. Um, yeah, so in the long term, uh, uh, there are uh, fundamental, there are no fundamental religious problems. Uh, in many cases, religion is, uh, is um, does it really is an hindrance to development, which uh, China does not have. Um, but the road is going to be very bumpy. So I don't, I, I, I don't think it's going to be all that smooth. Um, because uh, it is clear that the, cur the current economic model is not sustainable. Um, whether it's going to be a hard or a soft landing, I don't know. It uh, could be like hard, soft, but definitely China cannot go on the way it's going. It's way too much investment. Um, and uh, I can just like talk loosely. Most things you know, you know about environment, you know about lack of water, you know about uh, issue of product safety, um, but um, the, uh, I mean, the fundamental problem uh, here in China, there is too much investment and uh, they, might, they make too much of too many things and they end up wasting a lot of money in this process. And this is endemic to the system. Uh, it's a long story, but this is the way the system is built, which is very centralized and the banks are not under central control. So the, the whole uh, allocation, uh, resource allocation process is uh, way too centralized. There is too much money in the hands of too few people, okay? Now, but this is, I'm saying, eh, oh, all sectors are in oversupply. Whatever sector you just mentioned it, in three years in oversupply, okay? The key to make money here in China is to get in early and to get out or early. You know, focus on sector, be an early entrant and an early uh, exiter. Now, but this is nothing new. I mean, I've been reading the stuff on Chinese newspaper that the model has to change, that it has to go into consumption and so on, and consumption has to go. I've been reading. How long have you been in China for? How long have you guys been in China for? Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Were you reading the stuff seven years ago? We've been reading the stuff for seven years. We have to grow consumption. Haven't you? You know? The fact is, you know what happened the last seven years? Nothing. Consumption has gone down. 
You know, the fact is that, let me tell you, Chinese politicians have become like European politicians. They don't walk, they don't walk the talk. They bullshit. You know, they, you know, you read their speech, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. They just don't do it. It just doesn't happen. So the, the reality is this managing this country is complicated. So we get like to some extent uh, it's uh, one of those situations like Argentina or Italy where everybody has a solution. Everybody in Italy knows what needs to be done. But it's 30 years we can't get it done. Okay? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, so we get to a point where like there are some hurdles that are uh, very hard to divest. You know, moving the GDP, moving um, now consumption is one third of GDP, moving that one third and making two thirds. So taking one third of GDP off government, bureaucracy, and state-owned enterprises, and give it to consumer. That's not economics, that is politics. This is a tremendous political transformation. And, and uh, you try to take that money away from those few people, they're gonna go very, very mad. Nobody likes to be taking money away, okay? You know, just, I mean, they like to, in the general speech, everybody agree. But when it comes down to my money, then I don't like it, okay? Um, so the process is not going to be smooth. It's not that uh, the new leadership doesn't know what to do. It's just the question is how and when. Um, I, I mean, I can talk about the subject. In specific, I have all the points from previous speeches. Um, I am convinced, I mean, the, the system that's created this leadership has not created this leadership to be screwed. It's not that this le the current leadership had the mandate to say, oh, now you go up, you screw everybody else. It ain't gonna happen like that, okay? Um, and uh, the top leaders know what needs to be done. There is a pretty, pretty good technocracy here. People at PVOC know what they've done. You know, they, you, you read fantastic essays on, uh, from China universities, essays about how the financial system should be restructured. Um, but they know they have hurdles to overcome that uh, are tremendous. And everything, Every change revolves, I mean, we can talk about so many things, but the key system here is the financial system. The financial system does not allocate resources intelligently because uh, the financial system is 95% dominated by the state and the state lends to the state. So it does fuel itself. Okay, and, uh, and uh, the system uses the banks as if it is their treasury. It is uh, when the famous fiscal pa uh, compact uh, package was announced in 2009 or something, they announced it and three months later it was working. In a, in a normal country you have to make the new budget, allocate the budget. Uh, among different ministries, call for bids and so on. No, no, no. Here basically was, they said, we're going to spend $600 billion and the loan office at the top six Chinese banks took all the papers, all the loan application on the left and moved them to the right. That's how the, the stimulus package happened. They simply moved from, from a no position to a yes position. That was how it happened. You know, big, you know, just like indiscriminate lending to state-owned enterprises, mainly, or to provincial government, a lot of waste, uh, a lot of access, you know, like uh, stadiums or like uh, convention centers. There are convention centers every, everywhere here. There are oversized airports everywhere. I mean, and uh, 
until you solve this, this allocation mechanism, which is the financial system. This thing is not going to work. And, uh, but uh, if, you, if you play around with the financial system, you're really going to touch the roots of the power. The minute you touch it, the minute you say it's going to be a market-driven mechanism, market-driven, that means, I don't, market-driven means, I don't, I don't set the exchange rate, I don't set the interest rate, and I don't control the capital. Who the fuck I am? Nothing. Yeah, you see, so this is why the system, I, how long have you been talking, that, have you been here that Shanghai is, the, is, the, is going to be the, the financial capital of the world? Is it? Shanghai is nothing. No decision being made in Shanghai. All the banks are in Beijing. You can talk to Shanghai, you talk to branch managers. The head of Shanghai for BOC is a branch manager, basically. Yeah, it's a big branch, but it's a branch, you know? So this is, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, if you want to go to the core of the, of the, of the issue is the financial system. And um, how is that going to evolve? Uh, losing control of the financial system led to the market means you lose control of where the money goes to. You lose control of the resource allocation process. <laughs> big loss of power in Beijing. You know, you let the market, you set the rules, you let the market rule. <laughs> it's sort of complicated, a little risky and sort of complicated. And that, this is why every, every problem in China touches the bank first and then rever reverberates through the central budget. Because the first to get hit are the banks, because the loans got sour, and then uh, the bank lose money and the state has to intervene to save them. That's it, okay? Uh, how long is that gonna go? Ah, I mean, uh, now we are at the point where the system uh, ain't quite working because, uh, you know, people have negative interest rate. Why do, we have, do they have to give people such low interest rate? Because they need the bank to have a big, big spread to make money to cover for those losses. This is called the so-called uh, financial repression. Um, okay, let me. I got lost. Um, the uh, what, what I wanted to say. I wanted to say. Yeah, they need a big spread to cover the holes of the of the banks. Ah, in the, now the, the stock markets are not working. I mean, the Chinese stock market are the worst in the world. They got 70% off its peak. IPO process is totally dead. How many of you have money invested in either Shanghai or, or Shenzhen stock exchange? Why? You don't trust them, right? You trust putting money there? The statistics say, you know, the only people who made money in Chinese stock exchange are people who have bought and sold within 24 hours. They mean the only people who made money are people who got into IPOs. So basically, yes, you know, they don't fix it. They don't get the market system, but then they're going to get haunted by the system. You know, private sector cannot get money because banks do not know how to loan to private sector. Why should I loan to a private company and they get punished? I don't even know how to do it. If I can loan to a state-owned enterprise, the loan is guaranteed. Also, lending to private company takes generations. I mean, it's not like in one minute I can convert 10 million bank employees into lenders to medium-sized company. The heck? You know, it's not a rule. I mean, you really need to train people to do that. Is generation and generation. It ain't that easy. But in the meantime, the IPO process is broken. The markets are broken. Uh, the only hope a private company has to develop is to be able to list in Hong Kong, if you get that far. But the listings now are like nothing. Okay, so just no money is trickling down to the private, uh, to the private sector, which is the one that's created the most jobs. 
Financially institutions are more in trouble than we think they are because you know they keep roll, keep rolling over their debt. Um, and I think the system is not very very proactive, but is very reactive. So I think uh, at some point we'll have some crisis soon. I mean, at some point the people will say it can't go on. I mean, uh, the you know, growth is going to come down, losses are going to come up, and company will not be able to grow. And uh, there is a big hope about this new plenum. Nothing, nothing much is going to happen until the new plenum uh, of October uh, of the Central Committee to set up the economic priorities. We have to wait for October to see what comes up, how, how affirmative, how assertive they're going to be. And that we'll see. But uh, I think uh, for something to change, we have to go through some painful shock, I think. Uh, also because, also because for the society clearly is very extractive in China. There, is, there are a few people getting a lot and keep the other people out, out of the game. And the way the top makes the money is two ways. Real estate and IPOs. The way the big guys make money. Now, real estate, there is way too much, and it's getting to be a bubble that we all know, apart from Beijing and Shanghai, there is a lot of overbuilt, you know, 70 million units overbuilt, well, whoever, you know. People buy apartments, why? Even when I was a kid with my parents, when inflation in Italy was 20 something percent, the only, was the only thing was, huh, let's compriamo appartamenti, compriamo appartamenti, I remember my mother saying, you know, it was the same. When you get negative interest rate, you put your thing in bricks. Okay, the same thing is happening here. But the fact is, they build more bricks. They can't. They can't fit in. You can't make money on on IPOs anymore. So now you get to a point where things are negative for both uh, the top guys and the lower guys. And that is going to be when when the two negative will converge eventually. Then you will have a reactionary force. And uh, if you're looking for some indication of change. Is going to come after it becomes evident that the financial system ain't going to work. And the IPO process is not going to restart. So I'm really looking to see because now CSRC is saying, oh, we blocked the IPOs. There is a pipeline of IPOs of 800 and we'll wait for the fall. Now I want to see how many go through in the fall. Because I, I don't know to what extent is because CSRC is getting more selective or because people are not putting money in the market anymore. I mean, the, you know, serious savers are not putting money in the, in, the, in the market anymore. And how do you get, do you get funds? How do you grow a 7 8% if you don't fund the companies? You know? And let me tell you, Chinese SO, I mean, I've seen SOEs, and I know, what they, I mean, I, I'm old enough, I'm 57, so I've been like in an SOE environment up to my neck. Chinese SOE are not any different. Not the same stuff. I mean, you get promoted because you're because you're being nice to your to your boss, more for political uh, favor than for performance. That's you know the way it is. It's the same all over the world. Not you, but you know, you're not like exemplary of efficiency or. So you really need to get a more vibrant private sector and uh, a better resource allocation system. And uh, the indicators is will IPO will take up again? Will the stock market pick up again? Uh, will we see some lending going some other ways? <coughs> will we see some market mechanism in the interest rate, in the exchange rate, in the capital flow changing? Those are the things you really have to look for. I, I, I can talk for hours about, I think. I'd like to have more focus. Thank you, Benjamin. I think that we can start uh, the Q&A session if there is any